Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Samantha Hamilton. Uh, I am a media lawyer here in Georgia. Um, joining me today is Ken Fosquette, longtime editor with the Atlanta Journal-Constitution and a journalism professor at the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism. Today, Ken and I are going to talk to you about how to draft strong, effective public records requests that get results. Uh, this training is co-hosted by the Georgia First Amendment Foundation, otherwise known as GFAF, uh, as well as the University of Georgia School of Law First Amendment Clinic. So if you have been to um, one of GFAF's or the, or the First Amendment Clinic's trainings before, you might have seen us talk about what the Georgia Open Records Act uh, and the Georgia Open Meetings Act say. Um, but today we were hoping to do something a little bit different. We'll still be talking a little bit about uh, Georgia's sunshine laws, but we wanted to give you some really concrete, practical tips on how to request public records. So here's a, an outline of what we're going to discuss today. First, um, before you submit a public records request, you should figure out the records you want to request. You should then draft the request, submit the request, follow up on the request. And uh, finally, we'll talk to you about some recourse you can take if your, uh, if your records request is not responded to. So first, figuring out the records you want to request, uh, it's important to identify the agency or the entity that you want to request records from. The Georgia Open Records Act allows you to request records from state agencies, municipal agencies, uh, and even private entities that perform a state function, um, as well as private entities if at least a third of their funding comes from Georgia state resources. Under the Federal Freedom of, uh, Freedom of Information Act, or FOIA, you can request records from federal administrative agencies like the, the DOD or Department of Defense, the Department of Homeland Security, uh, the Environmental Protection Agency, et cetera. You should spend time on the agency's website. Whichever entity it is that you want to request records from, you should become familiar with what the agency does, what records do they already make available, on their website, so you could save yourself the, the time and hassle of drafting requests and waiting, you know, days, potentially weeks for a response. The agency might already have the records that you want on their website, so do your homework. Uh, but we do want to flag that just because an agency makes records available on its website uh, doesn't mean that you aren't entitled to request it. For example, if you submit a records request and the agency says, we're not going to produce those records to you because you know they're, they're on our website, go find them yourself. Um, that's not a proper means of denying uh, your public records request. You should also see what staff members' job titles are to inform you whose inboxes might have the most responsive records if you are interested in requesting um, the communication records of certain staff members, for example, or um, if there are certain staff members who are tasked with certain committees or certain specializations that can tell you um, who might be the, the proper custodian for the records you want. And another thing thanks. that we want, oh, yeah, go. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks, Sam. I was uh, just gonna say that we're mostly gonna be talking about the Georgia Open Records Act. And um, this little booklet that I'm showing up here is your, all th in all things, your Bible to the Open Records Act. It explains, it's got a copy of the act, uh, detailed explanations of the various provisions. And um, I encourage everyone who's interested in either open records or meetings to, to read this uh, guidebook very carefully because um, it, it, it can become your best friend, uh, particularly on the other end, if you encounter problems getting the access that you're after. Um, we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about FOIA today, but I did want to point out that most federal agencies have a section of their website devoted to FOIA specifically for their agency. And it gives 
uh, pretty detailed uh, directions on how to submit a FOIA uh, request to them. Um, as Sam mentioned, uh, particularly with FOIA, um, a lot of times, uh, many times records that you may be interested in have already been requested and a federal agency will post those records. So they'll already be on the website and you may find that you don't even have to ask them because they're there already. Thanks, Ken. Yes, throughout uh, the hour, we're going to keep referring to the Red Book um, and we'll provide some, some links to the Red Book later on, but you can also find it on, on GFAF's website. And a final note here. So the Open Records Act does not apply to court records. Court records are public, but the Open Records Act applies to agencies um, and private entities that, that contract with agencies. So just a, a brief distinction I wanted to make there. So once you've figured out the agency that you want to request records from, um, you should spend some time thinking about what records you actually want. Um, here is a non-exhaustive list of the types of records you can ask for. Uh, you can request financial records, construction records, contracts. You can even ask for, for drafts of documents or non-final versions of documents. Um, and just a second ago, I mentioned communication records. You can request the email correspondence of public officials, um, as well as the text messages of, of public officials when they are discussing matters uh, germane to their official duties. You can also request data and spreadsheets as well as audio files and video files. Ken, anything you wanna add here? No, I'll just highlight uh, the, 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 the data uh, is that the law specifically allows uh, people to ask for data that's collected by uh, an agency. Uh, we're going to have a little bit more guidance on how to, how to file uh, requests for data later, but uh, don't overlook uh, that as an option when you're thinking about uh, information, government information. You should also get familiar with what records are exempt from disclosure under the Open Records Act. It would be a shame if you drafted a request um, and spent weeks or months waiting for the request to be processed only for the agency to come back and say that the records that you requested are very clearly exempt under the Open Records Act. So I do wanna flag that the Open Records Act says, public disclosure shall not be required in the instance of over 50 types of exemptions. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that the agency is required to withhold the records, um, they may make the records available. Um, but here are some of the, uh, the key exemptions under the Georgia Open Records Act. Medical files, the disclosure of which, which uh, the disclosure of which would violate personal privacy. Pending rejected or deferred sealed bids or sealed proposals until a final contract award has been made in the case of contracts between uh, government agencies and private contractors. Records compiled for law enforcement purposes if the record would uh, reveal the identity of a confidential source. Records of law enforcement uh, in, in, in a pending investigation except initial police arrest reports and initial incident reports. So as I mentioned, there are over 50 exemptions to the Open Records Act, but the, but the Red Book, which I know Ken is gonna talk about in just a moment, does a really good job of summarizing them and making them a lot more digestible. Yes. Yeah. So all the exemptions are listed in the in the Red Book. Uh, the one caveat about uh, exemptions is agencies can't use an exemption to uh, make a blanket rejection of a record if there is information in the record that is subject to public dis disclosure. So just because there may be uh, a social security number on a document, they can't use that as an excuse to say the entire document is exempt and they can't give it to you. The law requires them to redact uh, anything that might be exempt and give you the information that is non-exempt. Absolutely right. Thanks, Ken. And here's a picture of the Red Book. <laughs> Uh, 
Another tip, consider calling the agency to ask what kinds of records they have. For example, let's say you ask for a certain request for a uh, request for proposal in your request, but the agency denies your records request, um, even though it has the same type of information that you are seeking in a different, differently titled uh, document. Maybe they call it a, a request for quote. Calling the agency to tell them what kind of information you're looking for can inform how you should frame the request. Um, sometimes I, I work a lot with, with reporters. Um, sometimes reporters and other you know, uh, non-journalist uh, folks think that they might have to hide the ball um, and not reveal to an agency what it is that they are requesting. Certainly, I think reporters tend to think this because they don't want to get scooped or reveal you know, what they're um, investigating uh, ahead of time. But there's really not a whole lot of benefit to to doing that. And there's you, you have much more to gain um, by just being upfront uh, with a records officer and say, look, I am looking for XYZ type of information. Do you have any records that could um, that could give me this kind of information? If so, how should I ask for that in, in a records request? You know, another thing in addition to calling is you can, um, you know, if you're close enough to go to the agency or the government body where you think the records are and talking to somebody there, um, public meetings are a great place to uh, get a sense of what kind of documentation uh, is, is uh, you know, flowing through the body. Uh, for example, uh, county, city, board meetings, uh, the, the board members always get a packet of information that uh, of the things that they're gonna be voting on that, that is way much more detailed than what might be included in the, the agenda. And you might then begin to see the physical records uh, and what they're called. Um, and so therefore you, you, can, you can ask for them. I mean, the, the idea here is that you're trying to um, get as specific as you can and ask for the record that you want in the way that the agency keeps the record. Along that vein of going to public meetings, uh, another tip is you should consider inspecting the records in person before requesting copies. The Open Records Act allows you to inspect records. So if you're looking at them, you don't actually pay uh, or the agency doesn't incur any cost of, of producing the records, right? When the Open Records Act was initially enacted before um, you know, digital records, the only records that existed were, were paper records. So um, that's one way to again, identify what records the agency has before you actually ask for your own copies. It's um, more difficult to, to take that sort of tact these days because so many records are held in an electronic format. Um, so if an agency is, you know, sending you uh, an electronic, you know, is, is letting you inspect an electronic version of a document, it's really easy for you to screenshot it or sort of make your own copy. The, the analysis doesn't really translate um, in the same way. Ken, anything to add? Yeah, the only thing I would add is that another thing that you can do, um, and this would only apply to certain kinds of records, but if the records that you're interested in is is information that's collected on a form say the the building office uh, at you know requires a, a builder to cer submit certain information about a project um, ask to see a copy of the blank form uh, and that then you know like okay what I'm interested in is on the form or it's not on the form uh, and that uh, and and if so you can you can ask for it Okay, let's say you finally identified the records that you want to ask for. Now we move on to step two, actually drafting the request. As Ken mentioned, you should be as specific as you possibly can. 
Um, when it comes to records, if you know the exact document you want, just ask for it. For example, the Joe's Crab Shack license application, business li license application, for example, just ask for that if that's what you want. Um, you could also consider attaching examples of the record you want, such as the same record from a prior year or maybe another business's uh, license application. When it comes to search terms, uh, you should use specific ter search terms when when you can. Um, not necessarily all record, not not the phrase all records related to something. And the reason for that is you want to imagine that the records officer doesn't know anything about the records that you are asking for. So you need to give them step-by-step -step directions on how to conduct a search. They don't necessarily know, you know, everything that you might about a topic, um, if this is, you know, something that you've been investigating for, for a while. Um, and so they might not necessarily know if a record is related to something. All that their computer, all that their database can tell them is whether a record contains certain key terms. So examples, uh, you could submit a request where you say, where you ask for all records containing all of the following terms in a records request to the Georgia State Board of Pardons and Paroles. And let's say you want all of these terms, supervision, immigration and customs enforcement and pardon to all um, turn up in every single record that, that you, that you um, are looking for. So only records containing all of these terms will be responsive. This can be helpful when you care about one um, specific issue. So I won't just get records that only contain the word supervision because um, there are probably millions and millions of, of pages of records in the agency's custody that contain uh, just the word supervision. But if I add additional terms, that narrows the scope of what is likely to turn up. So consider using this phrase, all records containing all of the following terms. On the other hand, um, maybe you don't know exactly what it is that you're, that you're looking for yet and you're really just um, investigating. Consider the phrase, all records containing any of the following terms in a request to the DNR. Sludge, tar, oil, spill. You might get some records that contain the word sludge, but don't have the word oil on any of the pages. Um, so this can be helpful for maybe broader, broader scopes of, of investigations. But in this instance, Narrowing by the time frame or by the sender or recipient of the record becomes really, really important. Ken, do you have anything to add here? No, that's good. No. So time frame. Uh, if you're asking for records created, sent, or received over a period of time, you should indicate the time frame, and that time frame should be as narrow as possible. This speeds up the production process because it inherently narrows the amount of uh, responsive records and it lowers the cost. Um, the agency is not going to charge you as much um, if you ask for only a week of records as opposed to asking for a month of records. Some examples, uh, you can give two finite dates uh, this can be really helpful if you know that a certain decision was made during this period, for example, or some other uh, timely event. Another way to frame time frame is between uh, August 1st, 2024, for example, and the date this request is processed. So this phrase, the date this request is processed, accounts for records that were created or sent or received after your request was uh, was submitted. So this is a helpful framing if the issue you're interested in is actively developing. Ken? Yeah, and so one point here about, you know, keeping a request narrow, 
um, if you get back records that are responsive and, and include information that you want, you can always go back and extend the time frame and say, okay, now I'd like to, you know, look at some of these records uh, during a, you know, an earlier time frame, uh, uh, if possible. Um, the other point to make here is that agencies are not required to keep many doc documents indefinitely. Um, all uh, public records are subject to what are known as retention schedules. Uh, and there are different retention schedules for different kinds of records. And they are kept in Georgia by the Department of uh, Archives. And you can go to the website of uh, the Department of Archives and um, drill down and find the particular record that you're interested in and see how long an agency is required uh, to, to, uh, to keep them. Um, so it may be, if you're looking for historical records, you may be out of luck. It may be that they had, you know, the, the uh, retention schedule had, had uh, run its course and they had disposed of those records. Now, under the law, they're required to, when they dispose of records, notify the archives department of the records that they got rid of. So at least there's a record of, of, of that. But um, retention schedules are very, uh, very helpful to know um, for, for different kinds of records. Yeah, that's a great tip. And uh, retention schedules can also be really helpful in informing um, and letting you know what types of records the agency keeps. So that can give you an advice, uh, that can give you advice on uh, what to actually ask for in the, in the request beyond um, the period of time that the agency is required to hold on to the records. When requesting emails, so you should limit the number of recipients or senders. We live in a world uh, where reply all is a thing. Um, so if you can narrow your request by um, by the people who sent an email or received an email, that can be really helpful. So you could ask for um, only emails received by the chair of a board, only emails sent by the mayor, and again, use the most narrow time frame possible. Uh, okay, if applicable, request just what is visible from the inbox. Ken, tell us your your thinking here. Yeah. So the problem with emails is uh, you're going to get into redaction er re redaction territory very very quickly. So somebody at the agency is going to want to review each and every email to see if it has information that should be redacted. And the most common kinds of things are addresses, social security numbers, financial information, personal information, broadly speaking. Um, and so uh, you could be waiting a long time for them to be going through every single email, uh, even if it's a very narrow search. Um, whereas an alternative is to get them to send you a month of the person's inbox, just in the what is visible in the inbox, which would be the date that it was sent, who sent it, to whom, and the subject matter. Um, that may give you an idea of, uh, you know, a specific subject or topic that you could go then go back and say, I'd like all emails to this person from this particular person, or that mentions this in the subject line. Yeah, that's a great tip. That's that that's not one that I've personally seen, but I definitely want to use that going uh going forward in the future. Okay, so here's uh, a little exercise. Feel free to participate um, in the Q&A function. Also, to plug the Q&A function, if questions are coming to you as we're working through our presentation, please uh, drop them in the chat and we will get to them all at the end. So here are a few different example requests. All memos written by Alejandro Mayorkas or his staffers. What do you think, Ken? No, too broad. Too broad, there are no limits, absolutely none. None by subject matter, none uh, none by, by date or time frame. no search terms. All right, how about this? 
All emails related to Greg Abbott's decision to shut down the border sent between January 2020 and December 2022. Still pretty broad. Still really broad. There's a clear time frame, right? But again, the records officer doesn't necessarily know what records are related to a topic. Something can be uh, related to a topic without it necessarily containing the keywords pertaining to that topic. Um, so remember, records officers can only search for keywords. They don't know whether something is pertaining to or related to whatever synonym you want to use there. Okay, how about this? All emails and attachments sent by Anthony Blinken between October 1st, 2023 and the date this request is fulfilled that contain any of the following terms, Israel Hamas ceasefire. Better. Okay, we've got sent by a particular individual, right? We've got a pretty finite time frame, October 1st and the date this request is fulfilled, that counts. Um, and we've got some search terms. Okay, so I don't know, looks pretty good, but given what we know about this topic, there is still a likelihood that these terms would turn up a really high volume of records. One between, uh, one, because the record says, uh, or the request says, I'm sorry, um, records that contain any of the following terms. So there's a possibility you could get a bunch of records related to, you know, that, that contain the word ceasefire that are not related to, that don't um, contain the other two search terms. Um, but also given how much has been produced um, in terms of records around this topic, I think you can anticipate that there would be a really high volume of records. So um, this requester might consider changing the request to um, all records that contain all of the following terms and adding additional search terms. And maybe since it's been a while since October 1st, um, maybe the research that they've done since since that time uh, indicates that they might want to adjust the time frame. Okay, more sample requests. Consult the Georgia First Amendment Foundation Red Book. So here's a link to um, some sample records requests that you can actually just plug in. GFAF has, has put in all of the great, beautiful statutory language for you, and you just need to type in the records that you, um, that you want. So if you go to gfaf.org, you can find all of these resources. And they're free, by the way, if that wasn't clear. Here's a sample request for records. So this is about to be a lot of text on the page, but I just want to show you um, what an actual records request looks like. So dear name of records custodian, you could also just say, hello, you don't have to you know, put their name. Um, but the, if the agency does have a designated records officer or transparency officer, you can send it directly um, to them or in, um, indicate their name. Uh, I am writing to request access to inspect and copy the following public records. And then here's where you would paste your request. I like to bold the request so that it is immediately visually apparent to the records officer. A little bit about the Georgia Open Records Act. Um, it says, as the Georgia Open Records Act requires, please let me know if the search copying and retrieval fees are estimated to exceed $25. If my records request is denied in whole or in part um, because it's exempt under the ORA, please provide me with the section of the act on which the denial or redaction is based. In cases where a portion of the document is exempt, please redact that portion and, re and release the remainder. So that's what Ken was talking about a few minutes ago, right? If there's uh, exempt information, the agency is still required to produce as much of the record as they can. They just redact the exempt information and then release the rest to you. There, there uh, was, uh, we're, yep. we're going to get, as, as Sam said, questions at the end. There was a question related to uh, the $25 fee uh, from a, uh, from someone in the audience. Um, you can put in your request or ask them to notify you if there is going to be any cost associated with this 
request before they fill fulfill, fulfill up. Um, the requester had said um, somebody, the, an agency was just automatically um, fulfilling a request and then and then charging something less than $25. Uh, you can preempt that by saying, uh, please don't fulfill um, this request until you've told me how much it's going to cost. And, and I say that's okay. And also if it's, that's a good question. And if the cost of production is less than $25, that raises another question in my mind, which is how long did it take them to compile the request? Um, spoiler alert, the first 15 minutes, we're going to get into this uh, a little bit later, but the first the first 15 minutes spent um, processing a, a request are supposed to be free. So that's what that question makes me makes me think of. So here's a sample request for records. No need to write all of this down. Again, this is accessible um, in a PDF online at gfaf.org. Mm -hmm. And here's a sample request for data. So very similar. Um, Ken, do you want to say Yeah, the, the big difference here is you're including in the request some language that, uh, uh, and this language is actually also in the act. Uh, about how you would like to get the electronic data uh, sent to you. Um, Microsoft Excel, DBF database files, or ASCII to text uh, files. Um, one, one note about, um, uh, and this is also mentioned in the, the law with respect to, to data, an agency can't uh, deny you a database because one of the fields in it has exempt information. So let's say, for example, you want to uh, you want to know how much everybody in your your city or town gets paid. So you ask for a database of uh, of all the employees and what their salaries are. That database that they keep may have, say, their social security numbers related to those employees, or maybe some other privileged information. So what the law says in that case is they need to um, eliminate those fields and give you the fields of data that are public, which would be um, who, who gets paid uh, how much. And similar to what we said earlier about um, you being able to request a blank paper form, you can also do the same thing when it comes to um, data. So you can ask for just what the fields are, um, the columns at the top and, and the rows on the side without the agency uh, actually giving you the data contained within the fields. All right. So you've drafted your request. It's narrow. <laughs> you've got your you've got your designated uh, custodians. You know, you've learned as much as as you um, we're able to educate your, yourself about um, about this agency, about this issue, and you are ready to submit your Georgia Open Records Act request. As a practical matter, you should figure out how to submit the request. This might sound, you know, a little silly, but um, this question comes up quite a bit. So you should, again, spend time with, uh, with the agency's website. Does the agency have an online portal that they want you to use? With a lot of federal agencies in submitting FOIA requests, they all do things a little bit differently, but it's very common to see federal agencies that use online portals. So if you have drafted your request, your request in a Word doc, that might be fine and good, um, but you might not actually have the opportunity to attach your um, your request as, as a Word doc. You might just have to copy and paste it into a text field. The online portals can also, um, depending on how they operate, sometimes they can keep track of um, whether a records officer has begun processing your request. Sometimes an online portal might also be a, the means by which the agency will communicate with you about your request. So even though you might have, you know, let's say I uh, use the GFAF template that says, please, you know, if you have any questions about this request, please email me. They might not email you. They might just send you a message uh, using the portal. And sometimes 
um, emails generated by the portal can go toward can go to your your spam folder. So just keep an eye out for for things like that. Sometimes agencies have a dedicated email address just for records requests that might or might not be tied to one individual staff member. Sometimes it can just be an inbox that a number of people are tasked with monitoring and responding to. Sometimes agencies have one or two uh, designated people whose title is something like public records officer or transparency officer. If the website doesn't have a portal or um, or a dedicated email address for, for all records requests, your next best bet would probably be to direct your requests to this person. If the website doesn't have any of these things, call the agency to ask how to submit the request. I know in 2024, people don't like to, to pick up the phone and, and call people out of the blue anymore. Um, but it can be really, really beneficial here. And you could also, um, I mean, I would really, I would really encourage uh, calling the agency and then, you know, you can get an actual person on the phone and whether or not they're um, the transparency officer, at least you will have talked to, to someone um, who can handle your request. Sometimes they, they might send, they might send you to the general, you know, info at, city of Atlanta, you know, .gov or whatever email address. Um, but at the very least, you've talked to someone, you've left your name and number and, you're for, you, and you've uh, forged that connection. Something I always tell reporters is it's better to uh, catch bees with honey than with vinegar. I know that it can be really tempting um, to, you know, it, it can get kind of frustrating when you feel like you're submitting a bunch of public records requests and they're not getting responded to and and you start to you know get this feeling that oh they're you know they're out to get me um and for that frustration to sort of seep into your tone um maybe you start to have these ideas that you know the agency is is being purposely you know um obfuscating but i really encourage you to try to do your best to strengthen um any relationship you can build with with folks within the agency because they can um really help you out uh the georgia open records act does technically allow for submitting requests orally but as a practical matter you should always submit your requests oh also, you should always submit your requests in writing. This allows you to keep track of the date you submitted the, um, the request, when you got um, a response from, from the agency, and when you know uh, it might be time to follow up on the request. Ken, any thoughts here? Yeah, that's, uh, that's very good. Also, if you were ever to go to the final step of having to take legal action, um, if it's not in writing, then you, 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 can't, you, you can't do that. Okay, so you submitted the request and now you're waiting. Sometimes uh, you can wait a really long time for the agency to respond to your request. So we really encourage you to follow up. The Georgia Open Records Act requires agencies to respond Within three business days, um, that doesn't always happen. Sometimes the risk, you know, best case scenario, although this is very rare, best case scenario, the agency gives you the records you want within three business days. That would be amazing. I have heard, but I have heard so few stories of that actually happening. Um, the second best case scenario is an agency sends you an acknowledgement email from an actual person within three business days. That doesn't just come from like an automated, uh, you know, it's not just an autom automated confirmation email. So you should send a follow-up to your records request. I would say, and I think, you know, it depends on your circumstances, um, but it doesn't hurt to follow up you know, if you really haven't heard anything after a week, definitely follow up um, and consider calling them. As we just mentioned, you should keep a log of all of your communications with the agency with respect to each individual request, because we recognize that you might have multiple requests 
going at once. Um, so you can keep keep track of the date you submitted the request, uh, the date you followed up via email, the date you called uh, seeking an update, who you spoke to. All of these things are good to keep track of. Okay, Ken, can I pass it to you? Yeah, so um, the, 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 the simple way to understand how an agency can respond to you is that they can do one of three things. As Sam said, they can uh, respond, get back to you and say, yep, oh, we got the records and come get them. Uh, they can respond, we have the records, but uh, it's gonna take a certain amount of time to compile them and get them ready. Um, the law allows for this, generally speaking, because some uh, agencies may not keep records uh, on site. They may be in a warehouse, they have to get them. So there's a little bit of coordination there. And then, of course, if there's any review or redaction, uh, there could be time involved there that extends beyond uh, three three days. Um, or the uh, third thing that can happen is the agency can respond and say, uh, you can't have the records because uh, either we don't have them, they don't exist, or they are exempt from uh, disclosure. So a couple of notes about all that. Um, if they say the records are exempt, uh, remember that they need to cite the specific exemption from the law that allows them to, um, to be exempt. Um, when you send in your request, and if they respond to you within three days, the response can't just be a simple acknowledgement of, yep, we got the request. It has to be, yes, we got the request, and here is our best estimate of how long and when we're, we're going to be able to get these records uh, to you. Recourse. So what happens if you submitted the request the agency um, just totally ignores it, doesn't respond at all, or the agency responds and says, no, we think all of the records you asked for um, are exempt from disclosure, and you don't agree with the agency's determination. Um, fortunately, you can push back on, on what the agency says, Oh, I'm sorry. And another possible thing that they might do is they might charge you a lot for production. Um, so the, the Open Records Act says that an agency may impose a reasonable charge uh, for the search retrieval redact redaction and production of records. Um, but the agency is supposed to use the most economical means reasonably calculated to identify and produce responsive non-excluded documents. As we mentioned earlier, the agency must tell you if the if the cost to you of producing the records costs more than $25. But if the estimated cost of production is more than $500, the agency is entitled to request prepayment before it even processes your request. So I separated these two out because they are sort of distinct. So in the first instance of um, the request costing, you know, $26. The agency will typically process, and again, I'm I'm speaking in generalities. Agencies do uh, do things differently, but it's pretty common for agencies to process the request if, on its face, it doesn't look, you know, super major. Um, the agency will tell you that it spent twenty six dollars in labor and copying costs. It then asks you to pay that amount, and then the agency produces records. If you're asking for a really high volume of records, and that is apparent from the face of your request, the agency typically doesn't even start processing the request until you've paid. So maybe they'll do a little bit of, you know, let's say you've got five search terms in, um, in your request, and it's it's narrow, you, you're only asking for records that contain all of these terms. Let's say the records officer does a quick search for all of these terms and they still see that um, 6,000 pages of records have, have come back. Rather than just diving right in and looking through all 6,000 pages to determine which of the material is um, is exempt and which isn't, the agency might just be like, okay, we've, you know, 
we've gotten enough evidence indicating that this is going to take our, our people, our staff, a really long time to process the request. So before we actually go ahead and do this for you, we want you to pay us ahead of time because it could be the instance in which um, the agency you know, processes a smaller volume request, but you decide that you don't want it anyway. Um, that's in the agency's mind, you know, that's time and, and labor that they spent processing a request that they're not actually going, they're not going to get their money back um, for that time that was spent. So that's the, uh, the justification under, under the law. One, one thing you can do, though, <clears throat> is you can ask for the agency to turn over records as they become available. So you don't have to wait until they've gone through everything that you've asked for and tied it up in a neat bundle for you. You can you can specify as you've worked through records, please give them to me. That said, sometimes agencies can charge you really, really high um, amounts. And if you think an agency has charged you an unreasonably high amount, you can ask them to give you an invoice and to itemize the costs, which should indicate the um, the hourly wage of the person who processed the requests. So as we mentioned earlier, the first 15 minutes of um, processing the request are supposed to be free. So if you ask for something that takes five minutes to get. Let's say you asked for one police report uh, related to an arrest that you just saw happen, you know, down your street a couple days ago. That's the only rec that's the only record that you're asking for. That problem that getting that record should not have taken 15 minutes. So if an agency tries to charge you for that, you should push back and cite to them the provision of the Open Records Act that says that the first the first 15 minutes are supposed to be free. Here's a citation right here. The agency is also not allowed to charge you for attorney review time. I've seen agencies in Georgia try to get away with this. They will send the requester an invoice that will include the hourly rate of, um, of the records custodian, of the records officer who processed the request. And then they'll also, which will be, you know, 15 to $18, give or take. And then it'll be one just block sum of $800 attorney review time. The Georgia Court of Appeals has held that agencies are not allowed to charge you for attorney review time in determining whether um, information contained in a record is subject to, you know, attorney client privilege is subject to um, the law enforcement uh, exemption to the Open Records Act, any anything else. They're not allowed to charge you for attorney review time, period. Another thing to look out for, did the agency apply the hourly wage of the lowest paid employee competent to conduct the search? Here's the provision, uh, this, it's the same provision as the above, um, of the Open Records Act that requires them to, to do that. Ken, anything here? Uh, yes, let's see, uh, not allowed to charge for review, attorney review time. Um, yeah, I'll keep going. I forgot what I was going to say. And finally, um, let's say that much, much as you've tried, you have pushed back on the outrageous cost of production. You've pushed back on the withholding but you really could use some assistance. Here are some uh, resources that you can go to who might be able to send a demand letter on, on your behalf. First is the Georgia First Amendment Foundation, GFAP. Um, another is the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press pro program. So they, um, the Reporters Committee is based in DC, but they connect with media lawyers all across the country. Um, who have lawyers on call prepared to provide pro bono legal services to um, to, rec to reporters, but also other members of the public who need help um, pushing back on some denials of their of their Open Records Act requests. 
There's also the Georgia Office of the Attorney General Open Government Mediation Program. So if you have submitted a request to a municipal entity in Georgia and you feel like the agency is not complying with the Georgia Open Records Act, you can contact the Office of the Attorney General um, and they might or might not uh, send a letter to the agency instructing the agency to respond to your Open Records Act request. Um, they also help with Open Meetings Act issues as well. Um, mixed success, I think. <laughs> uh, I think I think GFAF and the Reporters Commit Committee are, you know, the top two resources that I would um, recommend. But yeah, it's worth yeah. worth noting that the, the the current Georgia Attorney General, unlike previous Georgia Attorney Generals, has taken the position that they can't uh, get involved in open records or open meetings disputes that involve a state agency because they also represent uh, state agencies uh, and that their their purview would then be um, uh, only for local or non-state uh, government. That's right. Okay, so I've got uh, 1254. I think we should take some questions. What do you think, Ken? Yeah. Definitely. Uh, I, I remember now that um, the question that I was going to get to is uh, one of the uh, participants had said that um, Forsyth County, was it, or, or uh, was routing records requests to the county attorney. Um, I don't think that the law precludes them from doing that, but as Sam said, um, they can't charge you for whatever time the attorney is putting into reviewing requests. Um, there were other questions too uh, I saw about um, about attorney time being couched or, or uh, as review time or redaction time. Um, and I would push back very, very strongly on that because most redactions uh, of government documents do not require a law degree uh, to do. So as the law, as Sam was saying, the law requires them to use the lowest paid qualified person to do that work. And if it's a, merely a matter of going through and redacting social security numbers or telephone numbers or something like that, no argument can be made that uh, an attorney is the right person uh, to do that. Um, so let's see, um, going back. So, um, there was a question from Susan about, um, withholding records because they were private. Um, well, uh, you need to get them to, uh, say what, what specific exemption is, um, that they're, they're quoting, um, and, I think also push them if there's anything that is non-private, that that should be uh, then released to you as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm seeing a question from Savannah Levins. Any experience with the Glomar response cited as an open records exemption? Just got that back from the VA. Um, so Glomar responses, which are, I can neither confirm nor deny that these records exist, are supposed to be reserved for um, typically national security type matters, but they can also be invoked um, in instances in which the way the request has been drafted would imply the existence of something confidential um, that the government doesn't want the public to know about, which again is typically um, national security or, or law enforcement related. Um, a Glomar response from the VA, the Department of Veterans Affairs, seems very suspect to me. Um, given the case law on on Glomar and um, and like confidential informant um, and national security type type things, I yeah, I think that's very suspect. We requested formal complaints. We know were filed were uh, by employees about safety concerns to the VA. Okay. So is it that they they didn't want to confirm that complaints had been filed, but you already had knowledge that were that they were? Yeah, okay. 
um, that might be a good instance for you um, to have the people who submitted the complaints file privacy waivers. Then you can get into some issues of, you know, well, does this source want to make that? And again, I don't know that the context of, of this story at all, um, but I recognize that you can get into some issues of source safety and source anonymity. Um, but if you already have knowledge that something was filed um, from the person who filed it themselves, try to see if there's some kind of way to have a privacy waiver so that the agency can produce um, the record, at the very least to the person who submitted the complaint, who can then pass it on to you. Uh, Sam, there's a question from Alex, which I'll take a stab at, um, about the recent Georgia Supreme Court ruling uh, regarding records that are maintained by a private entity that does business with uh, a government. And so um, I'll try to explain that as best I can. So the law has always said that a uh, that if um, more than a third uh, a third of, of uh, money that goes to say a nonprofit or a private agency that's public money, records held by that entity are public records. That's always been the case. Um, however, there had been this limbo, this legal limbo that had developed where a requester would go to the private entity and that private entity would say, oh no, uh, you can't ask us for the records. You have to go to the public agency and ask for the records. And so you'd go to the public agency to ask for the records and they would say, oh no, we don't have the records. They're, they're held by the private entity, go to them. And so, but both people were not facilitating the, the retrieval of these records. And so what the Supreme Court did is first of all, reaffirm in no uncertain terms that um, private or, um, or nonprofit entities that receive government money are subject to the Open Records Act and that it, those entities have to respond to an open records request. Um, and so it was, a, it was a very important ruling because uh, it was being uh, used uh, in our view to um, prevent public records from being released. Uh, the foundation got it uh, filed an, an uh, amicus brief um, to that effect. Uh, and we were very, very happy that uh, the Supreme Court uh, ruled on this issue. Yeah, and I see that Kathy dropped a link in the chat um, about the recent decision. Um, so thanks for bringing that up, Alex. So many questions, so much engagement. I love all of it. I'm, I, I regret that we um, have limited time and we can't get to everything. Um, but if you have questions, GFAF is, is a great resource. The, the University of Georgia First Amendment Clinic is also a great resource. Um, so they can give you advice on, on what the Open Records Act yeah. says there. Um, but I do want to be respectful of, of everyone's time. Um, and you can get a copy of the video of this webinar. It'll be available on the GFAF website. Um, I've got one o'clock. It's been a so, pleasure, everyone. Sam, I'll, uh, I'll close out just trying to get to one question that is um, just, just popped up about 911 calls and records being subsumed into a um, an ongoing investigation and therefore being the basis for a denial. Um, we believe that this is a pretty egregious um, abuse of the Open Records Act and that they uh, that a 911 call that existed before a, an investigation was actually launched uh, falls under the category of an initial police report and that that should be made public. However, the law, the case law on it has gotten a little muddy and uh, it's an issue that we're, uh, we're working on. Um, I would also say, um, please get involved with the Georgia First Amendment Foundation. You can become a member for not very much money and stay current with the work that we do uh, and be an evangelist for these issues uh, in your own community. So thanks very much for for joining. And um, if you do contact the, the foundation uh, via our public email, uh, you'll be corresponding uh, with me. Uh, and thanks again. Bye, everyone.